John Ball. I was a blessing to walk back and worship a little bit there during the worship. I'll be with you. John Ball. I, I want to say, this is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. Amen. I want you to have your pencils and papers and make some notes today because I'm going to be speaking on something very important. I'm going to tell you about the most important prayer meeting in the history of the world. The most important prayer meeting in the history of the world. The prayer meeting lasted over three hours and it included four people. Three of those people slept through it. Only one person stayed awake for the whole prayer meeting. You know what prayer meeting I'm talking about? It's the prayer meeting that Jesus had in the Garden of Gethsemane. Gethsemane is a Hebrew word that means the place of the olive press. When you make olive oil, you take the olives and you squeeze them and smash them and press them until there's nothing left but pulp and oil. You squeeze all the oil out of it in order to get uh, out of the olives in order to get the olive oil. That's no mistake that the name of the garden where Jesus prayed just before he was crucified was Gethsemane, the place of the olive press, because he was under such pressure. And I want to talk about that this morning. Now, um, I, I said yesterday, I was talking about the uh, purpose of God with Israel. One thing I want to emphasize is that from 70 AD, when the Romans destroyed Jerusalem, until 1948, Israel never won a war, the Jews never won a battle. But from 1948 until now, they never lost a war. Why? And I, said, I told you yesterday from Psalm 102, after the Holocaust, the genocide of the Jews in the Second World War, after that, God turned the page. He turned the page from the judgment of Israel to the blessing of Israel. When that happened, Israel started seeing the favor of God. And since 1948, they have experienced the favor of God. Well, this other story I want to tell you today is about Jesus praying in the garden. After the Last Supper, which was actually a Passover meal, because, and the symbolism there is amazing, uh, or the reality, because Passover is about slaying a lamb for our sins, and Jesus became the lamb himself, the lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. So he had the Passover meal with his disciples, and then he was betrayed by Judas, and he went out in the garden and was praying before, before the soldiers showed up. And he prayed for three hours. He took his disciples with him, told most of them to wait back, but he invited John, uh, Peter, uh, James, I guess James, the three, three disciples, Peter, James, and John, yes, and uh, asked them to go with him. And yet they kept falling asleep. Now, there's something I want to talk about, about that, uh, this, this timing of Jesus uh, with going into the garden, followed by his crucifixion and then his resurrection. I call it the hinge of history. As, as God turned the page in the, at the end of the 1940s for Israel, at the time of the suffering of Jesus in the garden, God turned the page of all of history. We'll be talking about that in the next few minutes. It's a hinge of history. You know what a hinge is like? On a door, the door is fastened to the wall by a hinge. And there are three parts to that hinge. The pin is what the door swings on. But the pin can't just hang there in the air between the door and the wall. The, hint, the pin has to be in a hinge that has one flap on the wall and one flap on the door. Okay? So every hinge has three parts. And this hinge of history of Jesus has three parts. 
The first part is this prayer meeting in the garden. The second part is when he was actually crucified, and that's the pin. That is where all of history changed when Jesus died on the cross, right? But the third part is the resurrection. As we said last night, if he had stayed in the grave, it wouldn't have worked. We wouldn't have been saved. We wouldn't be alive. So it takes all three parts. So we're talking about just that first part now, the hinge of history, speaking about Jesus himself. Now, um, how well do you know Jesus? How well do you know him? Do you know that Jesus wept? Jesus cried at the tomb of Lazarus. He cried over Jerusalem. He wept. You know that Jesus laughed. There's a scripture you write on the reference for this in uh, Hebrews uh, 1 9. Hebrews 1 9 says that Jesus was anointed with the oil of gladness above his companions. If you went into a group of people and Jesus was in the middle of the group, and they were just sort of fellowshipping, you know, hanging out, like he did with the disciples on the Sea of Galilee, on the boat, on the mountain. And of course, there were times when he was speaking to the multitudes, but hanging out with just the disciples sometimes, they laughed. And you know who the one that laughed the hardiest, the greatest, the most joyful? Was Jesus. He wasn't a sour horse. He wasn't a sad guy. He was anointed with the oil of gladness above his companions. It's very important to understand about Jesus. And the point I'm making is Jesus had emotions. Jesus had emotions. He was emotional. All right? To make a point of that, Jesus was emotional. Now I'd like to have you turn in your Bibles, please, to Ezekiel chapter 28. Ezekiel chapter 28. And I'm going to try to uh, kind of fast forward on this message because I don't want to take too long. But I want you to get the meat. How many of you love meat? I asked you last night. You love meat? You want some meat of the word? That's what we're doing this morning. I love meat for our breakfast. This chapter of Ezekiel 28 tells us stuff about Satan. Now, Satan is our adversary. He is our enemy. A lot of people think Satan was equal with God. He wasn't. He was actually created by God. He's not equal with God. He's just one of God's creatures that rebel. And uh, so he's not equal with God. So this chapter uh, of Ezekiel 28 talks about two different characters. One in the first part of the chapter is called the prince. It starts right out. It says, The word of Jehovah came to me, saying, Son of man, say to the prince of Tyre, thus says the Lord Jehovah, because your heart is lifted up and you say I am a god, I, I sit in the seat of gods in the midst of the seas, yet you are a man and not a god. And the next uh, ten verses explain about this man called the prince of Tyre. Then it changes in the next verse, in verse 11, says, Moreover, the word of Jehovah came to me, saying, Son of man, take up a lamentation for the king of Tyre. So we have a man who is in charge of Tyre on, in the realm of men, and who thinks he's a god, and he's not, he's just a man. But then this next part talks about the king of Tyre. In other words, there's, a, there's an authority over this uh, this prideful man who thinks he runs Tyre, the authority over him is called the king of Tyre, and this is not a man. Notice as we read along here, because what we're actually reading about is Satan, the devil. It says, you are the seal of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. You were in Eden, the garden of God. You were in Eden, the garden of God. Who is in Eden? Who was in the Garden of Eden? How many people were there? Somebody answer me. Name them. Adam, Eve, God, and who's the fourth person? The devil. Okay? So in this chapter, it's saying you were in Eden, the Garden of God. It's either talking about Adam or Eve or God or the devil. And as you see along, you'll see it's talking about the devil. This may be information you didn't know about the devil. It's important to know this. Uh, so let's keep reading. He says, uh, you were, uh, every precious stone was your covering. The sardis, topaz, diamond, beryl, onyx, jasper, sapphire, tur turquoise, emerald with gold, 
The workmanship of your pipes, timbrels and pipes, was prepared for you on the day you were created. Now this verse tells us two things about the devil. Number one, the most important is, he was created. The devil was created. He was not eternal. He was not eternal. He was created by God. And he was created as this incredibly beautiful, bejeweled creature. Might have been the most beautiful creature in heaven. And, and, and it says his pipes, timbrels, pipes. I, I actually, this is my own opinion, but I think Satan was this beautiful uh, uh, cherub, this anointed cherub of God, whose very uh, body was a musical instrument. He would, when he would just breathe or speak, it was beautiful music. It was created like that way. And of course, that's why Satan is able to corrupt music and use it against God as we see around us today. Verse 14, you were the anointed cherub who covers. I established you. You were on the holy mountain of God. You walked back and forth in the midst of fiery stones. You were perfect in your ways from the day you were created. God did not create the devil evil. He created him as a perfect, beautiful, glorious creature. You were perfect in your ways from the day you were created till iniquity was found in you. By the abundance of your trading, you became filled with violence within, and you sinned. Therefore I cast you out as a profane thing out of the mountain of God, and I destroyed you, O covering cherub, from the midst of the fiery stones. Your heart was lifted up because of your beauty. The very created purpose and beauty of this creature was his downfall when his heart was lifted up with pride over his own beauty. Your heart was lifted up because of your beauty. You corrupted your wisdom for the sake of your splendor. I cast you to the ground. I laid you before kings that they might gaze at you. You defile your sanctuaries by the multitude of your iniquities, by the iniquity of your trading. Therefore I brought fire from your midst and devoured you and I turned you to ashes upon the earth in the sight of all who saw you. All who knew you among the peoples are astonished at you. You have become a horror and shall be no more forever. Now that's a description of Satan that's pretty, excuse me, pretty graphic, pretty specific. And I want to turn over now to Isaiah 14 where we have another uh, another description of Satan. And this gets more specific as to what his real problem was. I told you he was uh, he was caught up in his own beauty and had pride. But listen to what happened eventually. Uh, beginning at verse, I mean, uh, Isaiah 14, verse 12. Uh, this is the fall of Lucifer. In this, in this passage, he's, his name is Lucifer. Uh, I think he might have been one of the archangels, possibly, Michael. Gabriel and Lucifer, three, I don't know. But anyway, he says, How you are fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning. How you are cut down to the ground, you who weaken the nations. You who weaken the nations. For you have said in your heart. Now this is it. This is it. You have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will also sit on the mount of the congregation on the farthest sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. Remember the man of Tyre, the prince of Tyre, who thought he was a god, but he was just a man? Satan was a creature but thought he was God. He wanted to take over heaven and be God. He thought he deserved it. He was so beautiful, so wonderful. Satan's sin, uh, uh, continuing with the last, uh, the last verse 15, you shall be brought down to Sheol, great, to the lowest depths of the pit. Now I want to emphasize the very spirit of Satan, of Satan, the nature, the character of Satan, 
is expressed in this verse where he says, I will, I will, I will, I will, I will. Five times Satan says he's going to do his own will. I want my way. There's a, there's a song in America, I hope you know it, called I Did It My Way. Uh, Frank Sinatra is a singer. Uh, I call that the national anthem of hell. The national anthem of hell is I Did It My Way. Satan, his character, his sinful iniquity is in that he's doing his own self-will. You talk about we need as Christians to die to self. Well, this is why. Because when Satan fell, and when he went into that garden, and he corrupted Adam and Eve, instead of them doing what God said, they started doing what they wanted to do. He says, if you do this, if you eat this, you'll be wise, you'll be great, you'll be like God. That's what he wanted to be. And he, so he tempted them with that same temptation. So, I want you to just say it with me five times. The downfall of Satan was because of saying, I will. Would you say it with me five times? I will. I will. I will. I will. I will. That is the spirit of Satan. That's his character, his nature. Now, let's get back to the garden for a minute, or to end this. In the garden of Gethsemane, Jesus was tempted. How many of you know Jesus was tempted, right? Was tempted. Do you know in Hebrews, uh, let's see the reference, it's Hebrews, you want to write this down. Um, I have it written down here somewhere. I think it's Hebrews 4. No, I don't see it. Hebrews, yeah, Hebrews 4.15. Hebrews 4.15. Make a note of that. You don't have to turn there. But in that verse, it says that Jesus was tempted in every way we are, yet without sin. How many of you believe Jesus was tempted for things? You ever think Jesus was tempted for food? Remember when the devil tempted him in the wilderness? You can, you're, you've been fasting for 40 days, turn these stones into bread, right? He was tempted to eat bread, turn the stones into bread. He could do that. <laughs> he could turn the stones into bread. But he didn't do it because he wasn't going to do his will. He was doing the Father's will. Satan was always kind of tempted to do his own will. That's what Satan's trying to do to you and to me, to make us do our own will. Jesus was tempted in every way. Judas is on his way to betray him. He knows his time has come. And so he's praying in the garden. He said to them, my soul is exceedingly sorrowful. My soul, speaking of his self, right? In myself, I'm exceedingly sorrowful. He says, waited and grieved here. Uh, even to death. Stay here and watch with me. He went a little further and fell on his face and prayed, saying, Oh, my Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. Now, we don't need to read it all, but if you read, as you read on, he says, a second time, he goes to the Father and prays. He says, Father, is there a plan B? Is it, don't you have something else? Is there another way? But nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. And then a third time, he goes and he prays the same prayer. Now what I want you to understand here, I, I, I'm asking the Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, grip our hearts with this reality. That Jesus was tempted to not go through with God's plan. If he was tempted in every way like we are, if God is asking you that in, a, in just a few minutes you're going to be betrayed and in a few hours you're going to be nailed to a cross and die, would you be tempted to pass on that invitation? <laughs> would you be tempted to not 
Or, would you want to do that? Would you want to suffer on a cross and be crucified? Neither did Jesus. His self will didn't want to do that. He was hoping there was another plan. And so three times he asked, is there another way? But all three times he finished by saying, not my will, but thy will be done. You know that medical science has, has now demonstrated and proven that a human being under incredible uh, stress, uh, emotional stress, internal, not, not, being, not being hit with a hammer or something, but I'm talking about from the inside, stress and great, especially in a decision like this, that what happens under this most extreme stress is that the, the little tiniest little vessels in our, in our bodies, near our skin, the capillaries they're called, under stress, Necessity with the crucifixion and the resurrection. Equally important. It's all one hinge. History turned. God turned the page because the curse of Satan, which is, I will, 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 I will. Jesus changed it. Not by will. It hurts. It hurts. It's hard. The Christian life is not hard. It's impossible. It's impossible without the supernatural power of God in us, the grace of God in us by the Holy Spirit, to be able to say with Jesus, not my will, but your will be done. When Jesus said that in the Garden of Gethsemane, the curse that was on mankind for self-will was reversed. Jesus reversed the curse of self-will to God's will. Yes. That's where we are. We are now on the other side of that door. The door opened wide on the hinge of the, of the Garden of Gethsemane the cross of Calvary and the resurrection tomb that is empty because of not my will, but thy will be done. Would you stand with me, please? What I've just given you is eight words I've given you eight words that changed history. 
eight words that change history. Do you know what those eight words are? Not my will, but thy will be done. Those eight words will change your history. Pastor Masambo has been emphasizing achievement. You have to pay the price. Do you understand maybe a little better this morning the price that Jesus paid even before the cross? In the garden, in the garden, he prayed the eight words that changed history. They changed the history of the world. If you pray those eight words, if you pray those eight words, it'll change your personal history. I want you to just pray that with me as we close. And we're going to pray it the same way that Jesus did three times. I'll say it first and you repeat after me. Not my will, but thy will be done. 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 Now let's shout it to God. Not Thank mm -hmm. you.